Hey everyone, it's Brian. It's good to be back. And today we're going to dive into the world of claims, right? Supplement claims, in particular structure function claims. So these are claims that are like, you know, how it, you, your product will improve memory, build strong bones, uh, build strong muscles, performance, that type of thing. Detox is a big one as well. I want to sh use uh, a lawsuit, FTC versus Quincy Bioscience. We're going to dive into that. And we're going to be covering quite a bit of ground. We're going to dive into the lawsuit itself. What evidence was presented? What did the jury rule? What was FTC's position? We're going to dive into the FTC's guidance as well when it comes to claims. I think a lot of you are going to be surprised about the positions and possibly think that they're overdoing it, but they do make some really strong points. And then obviously we're going to dive into the key takeaways with regards to your product. So let's get to it. All right. So this is FTC versus Quincy Bioscience Holding Company. And as you can see here in this particular article, there are two issues that are at the forefront here. And I think a lot of people in industry, particular lawyers, compliance experts like myself, uh, marketing experts are very, very keen as to seeing what happened. Um, so here are the two issues, the substantiation standard for dietary supplement efficacy claims and the burden the FTC must meet to bring a complaint against a dietary supplement uh, company for alleged false and deceptive advertising. Now we're going to focus primarily on the substantiation standard for dietary supplement efficacy claims. So essentially what this means, the substantiation standard, that is essentially saying how much evidence do you need to substantiate a claim or how much evidence do you need to back up a claim, right? You need to substantiate it, you need to back it up. And so we're going to dive into that. Um, but what are these guys getting hit on, right? Like that's really important here. So if we scroll down, um, these are the claims that FTC is going after. Uh, Prevagen improves memory. Prevagen improves memory within 90 days. Prevagen reduces memory problems associated with aging. Prevagen provides other cognitive benefits. Uh, that all of these benefits are clinically proven. So why are why are why is this interesting? At least to me. Um, those that have worked with me, there's a couple things here. First of all, memory claims, brain function claims. These are claims that have seen a lot of litigation, seen a lot of action uh, from other law lawyers or competitors uh, going after supplement brands, memory, brain function type claims. Now, this was prior to this whole nootropic craze, but there's been a lot of precedent sent in the industry. All right. So typically I see memory claims, brain claims to be more in that higher level risk category. You've also got this trigger word improves, and this is nothing, there's nothing wrong with the word improves. It's just that what this does is it raises the bar in terms of how much evidence you're going to need um, because you're actually promising that this product is going to actually improve memory. It's going to increase your cognitive ability to memorize things versus just say support, you know, what your brain is already doing. This other claim within 90 days, now you're adding a time element. You're adding a time element of promise. Within 90 days, you're going to get this benefit where you're going to see this elevated improvement in memory. Uh, Prevagen reduces memory problems associated with aging. There's again, nothing particularly uh, crazy about this here. You know, aging is not a disease. That is a very normal condition. Uh, reduces memory though. Again, to me, these are trigger words. Improves, boost, reduce, decrease. Because now you're, you're, you're making a promise in every instance that this is going to happen, right? It's going to reduce memory issues. Again, I'm not saying that you can't say these claims. I'm just saying it's important to put these, these words into the right context because it does impact, uh, from my experience, it does impact the level of substantiation, the level of evidence you need to provide. Prevagen provides other cognitive benefits. That's very broad. Um, you know, a lot of times when clients are new to this game, they think this broad um, interpretation is a good thing in the sense that, well, hey, look, I've interpreted as broad it could be, you know, small improvements to large improvements. It could be in, it could be anything. Why, why can't I say that? Whereas um, from my point of view is when it's gray, when it's very broad, it gives the lawyers a reason to go after you because they're going to interpret that. Well, other cognitive benefits could be you're promising the world. You're maybe you're, you're going to say that's going to prevent Alzheimer's. Now, I'm obviously you know, being facetious here, but you can see my point. When it's gray, yes, you, the brand, can interpret it one way and probably favorably for yourself, but it also gives the other party the leeway to interpret it their way 
and now you got to spend a ton of money to defend yourself, right? The last one here is that all benefits are clinically proven. Now, this term is very, very common, and a lot of people want to use this. But again, what does that mean from a substantiation standpoint? And the last one here is that all of these benefits are clinically proven. Now, this is a very common term in the supplement space. I know a lot of clients want to use that, or they want to use language like clinically studied uh, to help level the playing field a little bit, maybe tone down the language so it's an easier bar to uh, hit. But we're going to dive into some of these things and the vulnerabilities that it still imposes on a supplement brand. Now I'm going to switch over to this article. And this is an article that I brought up in a previous video for my YouTube channel. And we went at a glance, essentially, through it, but I want to dive into it a little bit more because I thought there were some really, really cool things happening here. And you could see it both from the defendant's side as well as FTC side. The FTC's truth in advertising law, uh, where the advertising must be truthful and not misleading. And before disseminating an ad, advertisers must have adequate substantiation for all objective product claim. Now, in here, they also say that they use the 1998 guidance, and that's because the guidance that was more recently released, which was, I believe, last year or so, um, they obviously didn't have access to that guidance, which is why they had to rely on the 1998 guidance. But I will say that the 1998 guidance and the, the more recent one isn't that much different. They, they kind of just expanded more for different product categories, not just natural health uh, supplements, for example. And they also brought in like social media aspect of it all. So, but the principles in the 1998 guidance still remains the same for the most part. So the two things we're looking at here, advertising must be truthful and not misleading. And then obviously we want to have adequate substantiation for all objective product claims. So with regards to adequate substantiation, what does that even mean, right? What could that look like? So let's jump over to FTC's guidance. Okay, so this is FTC's guidance document. I've, we're, we're moving over to that document for a second here. And uh, this entire section is about substantiating claims. And it's talking about how um, marketers need to have uh, adequate support for their claims, which we already know. Um, but the bar for substantiation is quite high. Like that's the big thing here, right? Even it says FTC substantiation standard is a rigorous one, particularly when claims are related to health, right? It is designed to ensure that consumers can have confidence in the accuracy of information presented in advertising. A number of factors determine the appropriate amount and type of substantiation required, including they kind of go into all the different factors. So you can already see here that it's not as simple as, hey, Brian, can I make this claim, right? Because there's a lot of things that go into it. Now, is this overkill? Maybe. But again, this is the bar that FTC and FDA uh, you know, has. And by the way, this is an FTC guidance document. The FDA works very, very closely with the FTC, and they're pretty consistent with each other. Now, I'm going to jump down here. Um, the amount of substantiation uh, that experts in the field believe is reasonable is one of the uh, criteria to determine, you know, how, you know, what level of evidence you you have to, to back up your claim, right? Essentially, if we put all the experts in a room, what's the general consensus here? Now, what's interesting is that they kind of go into, um, you know, what is this uh, level of standard? So here it is. FTC's rigorous substantiation standard of competent and reliable evidence. So competent and reliable scientific evidence is the standard. But you and I both know, like, well, what does that mean? Like, that, that could be subjective. Like I said, you could have, you could have uh, experts uh, arguing for one side. You could have experts on the other arguing for the other side, right? That this isn't effective. And then you got another group of PhDs that say that it is effective. So what is it? So then FTC breaks it down even further. All right, FTC has specifically defined that the standard, that's, the FTC has more specifically defined that standard as tests, analyses, research, or studies that have been conducted and evaluated in an objective manner by experts in the relevant disease condition or function to which the representation relates. And two, are generally accepted in the profession to yield accurate and reliable results. Now, what's interesting here is that it doesn't necessarily say it has to be a clinical trial, right? They're essentially saying there needs to be this general consensus. It needs to be science, like reliable scientific evidence. It needs to be some kind of test, analysis, research, or studies um, that is done in an objective manner. 
right? So the FTC doesn't explicitly say it needs to be a placebo-controlled, uh, double-blinded uh, human trial. But as a general matter, substantiation of health-related benefits will need to be in the form of randomized, controlled human clinical testing to meet the competent and reliable scientific standard. So in the, in the law itself, it doesn't say what, um, you know, that you need to have a clin clinical trial. But FTC's interpretation of that law is that you do. And that's the crux of this issue here for Quincy Bioscience, which is very interesting. We're going to take a look at this. Now, you know, when we're talking about clinical trials, you know, we're, we're talking about the design, we're talking about the number of subjects, we're talking about whether you're using a placebo or not, we're talking about whether it's testing humans. So FTC has their interpretation. Quincy Bioscience, um, as well as other supplement brands may have their interpretation. So let's dive into what Quincy says. So Quincy Biosciences presented their panel of experts, right? Their expert testimony concerning research showing that dogs who took a epoecorin orally showed detectable levels of it in their cerebral spinal fluid and blood plasma. Quincy also argued that such findings indicate a a poet Corin can cross the blood brain barrier while regulators have denied the company has adequate evidence to support such a hypothesis. So what I want you to take away here is that A, this was, you know, evidence showing in dogs. This was expert testimony. And, you know, obviously they're doing test analysis research to demonstrate that um, this particular molecule can um past the blood brain barrier. Now, why is this important, this blood brain barrier issue? FTC, um, in the original suit, they accused them that the, that the molecule couldn't cross the blood brain barrier, so, or that they didn't have evidence to support it. So anyway, uh, Quincy showed that they did have evidence, right? Then they go on to say, uh, so this is from Quincy's defense side, uh, the plaintiff, the New York AG's office, told you at the start of the case that there was no science backing up our marketing claims for Prevagen, right, yet. Um, three weeks, nearly three weeks later, I think you've heard more science than you ever thought possible about one dietary supplement. They provided science, but you and I both know now that FTC's position is that it needs to be human clinical studies, right? That's, that's FTC's interpretation of the law, right? And in the guidance right here, the Quincy Bioscience acknowledges, look, you guys are using, you know, the, the, the bar is competent and reliable uh, scientific evidence, but also that the document explains that substantiation is flexible and need only be adequate that manufacturers only need to have a reasonable basis for making the claim. And the government will consider the totality of the evidence when evaluating claims for dietary supplements. So this excerpt, uh, I believe, is coming from the 1998 document. Now, FTC has been very explicit more recently that they're expecting human clinical studies, but ultimately, competent and reliable scientific evidence is inter open to interpretation. And like I, I showed you earlier, um, where did it go here? It was this one. You know, even though FTC has been very explicit that they want clinical trials, the law doesn't necessarily say that. And you can tell here, if you look at all these other criteria, substantiating claims, you want to look at the type of product, you want to look at the type of claim, you know, the benefits of the truthful, of a truthful, truthful claim, consequences of a false claim. There's a lot of other factors that go in to determine competent and reliable evidence, right? And that bar. So that's the, that's like one of the big call-outs here that obviously Quincy is arguing, right? Like, you know, even though, um, you know, FTC's interpretation is that we should have uh, placebo-controlled trials, it doesn't have to. The substantiation is flexible. Yeah, you do, which is fair, right? Like test analyses, research that's con conducted in an objective manner. That was what was stated, um, right? Just because FTC's interpretation of the law is mentioned doesn't mean that that interpretation is correct. That's what Quincy's arguing here, right? There is no set, the guidance makes it clear that there's no set protocol as to how uh, to how the research needs to be conducted and to be acceptable and no fixed formula for this type of number of studies required, right? Um, and the guidance further advises that in vitro research, animal research, RCTs, and meta-analysis will all be considered even if no single type of test is even required. Now, this is all going back to the 1998 guidance document. And obviously, it, there's been a lot of time since 1998 and a lot of new things in the market uh, that has happened since then or has been launched in the market, right? But their points are still valid, right? Because the law is the law and there is 
you know, a lot of gray in, in that. So in, in essence, Quincy comes back and says, look, you know, given all this and the evidence that we have, you know, we conclude that the science supports the claim at issue. So let's hear about FTC's position, right? And you can see what they're focusing in on and how they think. So essentially they're saying, we are here because Quincy has made the following deceptive claims on television and on packaging, and then kind of go through all the claims, you know, improves memory, improves memory within 90 days. And then they say, you know, the company is selling fear, perhaps the most powerful tool in the toolbox of the uh, advertising industry. Is it, I don't know, I need to see the, the ad to see if this is true. Reading behind the lines or between the lines that it is more fear-based. She asked the jury to ponder a crucial question, whether there is competent and reliable scientific evidence to support the advertising and marketing claims that Quincy has made about Prevagen, the advertising claims Quincy chose to make right? Competent and reliable scientific evidence. That's what they're arguing for, right? Um, and then on top of it, under New York law, which means the science Quincy ha has must not be just any science, but science that would be sufficient to support the claims at issue here. It improves memory, clear thinking, and clinically shown. So the, and the reason why I'm bringing this up is these were the terms that caught my eye as well, right? Like you're, this improves, right? Obviously a memory claim, right? Memory in itself, that the fact that it improves it, uh, clinically shown, right? So these are key things because they, these come up over and over again with, with my clients. And like I say, I consider these as like, the, you know, they're considered trigger words. They're more like, ah, okay, now that you've got it, I want to dive into it more. I'm not saying that you can't say it. And, and usually once you dive into it more, you realize, okay, well, they don't have this data. They, they're lacking this. The formula isn't properly formulated, all of these things. But for me, it's kind of like a trigger word. That's hence the term, right? So then the plaintiff brings in their uh, experts and essentially their experts saying, look, that uh, a randomized controlled blinded clinical trial is required to support the claims to improve memory and thinking, which to me is fair, right? Why, why wouldn't that be the standard? They're just based on pure science alone. Look, if we talk about you know, the vaccines, et cetera, we are relying on clinical data. We're not relying on animal studies. Now, <laughs> maybe things have changed and maybe, you know, boosters and stuff like that isn't in that boat. But the question is, how do we feel about that? Are we okay with using data from animals, extrapolating that to humans and thinking that it's fine in that scenario? But what about this scenario? What about supplements? So just throwing that out there. I'm not arguing one for the other. I'm just saying, how would we feel as a consumer about taking these products ingested? And are we okay with this? Does just common sense dictate that uh, placebo-controlled trials make sense? Right? So FTC's position is that, yeah, we should be using this as the bar. If we look at any other uh, drug or um, studies, you know, what we learn in, in, in you know, undergrad, basic science would normally say clinical controlled trials that's that's the the gold standard right without a randomized double blind placebo controlled clinical trial no amount of animal studies can add up to the evidence sufficient to make a claim to improve memory interesting right what do you guys think now they're diving into the actual study that quincy provided uh which brings us to quincy's a Madison memory study highlighted in part two of this series of this article. Uh, Matsuchek argued that Quincy repeatedly misrepresented what the study actually showed and didn't take time to explain to jurors what the results might mean outside of the computer tests. For example, she noted the company's experts didn't discuss whether improving a score on a cognitive test by one thousandth of a second translates to any sort of meaningful benefit in real life. This is a good point. I mean, it's one thing to show in an animal study or in a test tube study or even like in a questionnaire, you know, some sort of benefit that's measured that we can extrapolate from the data. But is that enough to show a, a meaningful benefit in real life, right, to the actual end user? You know, it's one thing to just say that this is going to, I don't know, generate, you know, new skin or beauty from within, that type of thing. But are you actually noticing it? Right. And maybe the data shows that, you know, if you go at a microscopic level, you can see the skin cells regenerating at a higher rate, or maybe that the skin epithelial cells are a little bit thicker. But ultimately, does the end consumer notice less wrinkles? I'm, again, I'm making up these type of scenarios, but this is essentially the point. Is it clinically meaningful? Are you noticing at a real level, at, at, the, at the level that we're operating at, not just the cellular level or, or microscopic or something that was extrapolated in the test results? 
Then they dive into some of the flaws of the studies, right? Including that the protocol failed to mention any plan to evaluate the subgroups. And this is the thing, right, with, with studies. And, and this is uh, an issue with the dietary supplement uh, world in general. And that the vast majority of studies, anybody can pick it apart, right? The, sub, the number of subjects are, are very small. The study design um, isn't as strong. Maybe they didn't have like the proper washout period. There wasn't a placebo or, or maybe that um, it wasn't double-blinded. Um, maybe that the subjects weren't North American. All of these things, one could pick it apart, right? And so uh, on top of it, the, the studies in, in the supplement space it's quite limited, right? There's not a lot um, because there's not a lot of money behind it. So there's that driver as well. So the pool of studies are, are limited, right? For human clinical studies, a lot of the times you might find some animal studies, some test tube studies, but not the human clinical trials. And then when you do get there, it's not properly designed. And I think there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, um, the people that are doing the, the studies themselves, they're not going to the right experts to help them see it from an FTC or an FDA bar. They're designing it from an academic or a research standpoint, but they're not thinking about FDA or FTC, right? They obviously don't have the funding. That's another issue. And then obviously, you know, the motivation behind it, you know, it's hard to protect this information. It's hard to protect it. So that's only for one type of ingredient that's manufactured by one supplier. A lot of the times the studies that are being leveraged are for, uh, you know, for another company, uh, but, you know, a generic version of that ingredient wants to take, you know, take advantage of that study or make it look like, you know, that study also applies to their material. Material. Um, and as a result, the, the, the company that invested in the study, you know, a lot of the times they don't get all that money back. They don't get their investment back uh, because people are going to a generic version of that ingredient. And further on, she goes, and she described that the write-ups are an example of selective reporting where you only show the results that support the conclusions that you want to promote. Yeah, this could happen too. I've seen that. You know, it's funny when, you know, there's a couple ways of, uh, of doing this. Let's just say you, you did a study and you didn't find the conclusion that you were hoping for. And, you know, the conclusion that you would write in, the, in some authors, right, of the, of the study, so they would interpret this two ways. Either that the supplement or the ingredient was ineffective at that particular dosage for that particular issue. Or they could say, um, you know, we found a, a positive trend, but we couldn't find statistically significant effect. And more research is required. So, you know, the, the latter way kind of softens the finding. It shows, okay, they found something. They just couldn't find the statistically significant version of it and that more research is needed. It sounds a little bit, you know, hopeful, <laughs> right? Whereas the other way of saying, you know what, it just wasn't effective at that dose is more objective. And, you know, that's something that's being brought up here. You know, are we selectively reporting? Are we only selecting the data that we want to show? And hey, you, you and me both wouldn't be surprised if this type of practice is also done in the pharmaceutical world, which, you know, when, you know, being exposed to this stuff over and over again, you kind of question all these things. I'm going to tell you that right now. And not just in the supplement space, but in the pharmaceutical space. Uh, anytime I'm seeing uh, data that's being uh, presented in a journal, a news article like, uh, you know, CNN or Fox News, those types of things, I'm always thinking about yeah, I really want to see the actual studies just for myself. So anyway, it keeps going and I don't want to go through all of this. So obviously there's a lot more that FTC comes back with, but let's get into the actual verdict from the jury. So on the one hand, the jury found all eight challenge statements lacked competent and reliable scientific evidence. On the other hand, the jury determined that six of the eight claims were not materially misleading. Like, what does this mean? So essentially, the jury found six out of the eight claims weren't misleading, right? They weren't misleading the consumer, but they didn't have the scientific uh, evidence to back up their claim. Interesting. Like, how, how do you take that as a consumer? Like, if you knew that the product that you're taking or using, it wasn't misleading, the evidence to show that that is true isn't really great. It, it's really confusing here. And that's the big takeaway in this verdict is that it actually creates more questions than answers, unfortunately. Working with FTC attorneys in the case against Quincy, the New York AG defined competent and reliable scientific evidence, uh, 
CARS as a rigid drug-like standard. Olson commented, the jury subsequently found that the provision claims were not supported by CARS as defined by the regulators, but the jury still found the majority of health-related claims, including clinically proven claims about the supplement at issue, were not materially misleading. As I previously wrote, this is the author, as I previously wrote, the jury's findings are paradoxical in my view. Sure, they found Quincy had no competent and reliable scientific evidence for the challenge statements. However, they understood the term of art. Yet by finding most of Quincy's statements were not materially misleading, jurors seem to be concluding that Quincy had a certain amount of convincing evidence to support such claims such as Prevagen improves memory, Prevagen is clinically shown to improve memory within 90 days. The verdict was full of contradictions. Um, and the jury found that all eight challenge statements have the capacity or the tendency to deceive. Like, like I said, this is creating more questions than answers, but it's very interesting, isn't it? And this is why the whole area of claims can be very, very great. And when, when clients come to me like, hey, Brian, I want to say a detox claim. Can I say this? Can I say it's clinically studied? Can I say it's clinically proven? <laughs> it's not that simple. And, you know, I want to take into context the nature of the claim, the nature of the product, the nature of your, your audience, uh, the level of substantiation currently to date, and then obviously the level of risk you as a brand are willing to make. And of course, your competitor set. We need to look at all of these things to determine, okay, can you say this? It's not as simple as I use these three words. Can I say it? Can I say clinically studied? Can I say clinically proven? Can I say detox? Can I say that this is going to help repair my bones, right? Like that type of stuff. And one, you know, one of the practices that I use is, you know, the trigger words, are the words that we're using, are the claims that we're trying to go after, is, is there history of litigation, right? How do we already eliminate or prevent these types of things even going to you, these types of actions or litigation actions or vulnerabilities even happening in the first place? That's like the goal number one. I don't want you to go into this situation. Yes, the chances of you getting sued by the FTC is low, but there's going to be competition that's going to be looking at you, right? We see now foods testing products. Also, even if you were innocent, you still have to defend yourself, right? Like there's, there are other agencies, there are other industry groups like the National Advertising Division, the NAD, which is like, you know, the industry's own self-regulating uh, group kind of like the FTC, but it's, you know, it's an industry self-regulating uh, entity. They're going to look at these things very similar to the FTC and they could go after you. Competitors do that all the time. They'll look at your product, see a claim that they don't like. They don't like that you're making that claim. And they're going to report you to the NAD and now you have to defend your claim. So, you know, pe the competitors are policing each other, right? Then of course, Amazon's, I think they're going to step up their claims in the future, not just testing, but the claims, right? So there's these other elements. And of course, the brand themselves, you know, how much risk are you willing to take? And for me, it's like, let's just put enough friction into all of this so that no one's looking at you, right? How do we do this? Or that they'll just go look at someone else that didn't do their due diligence and didn't, you know, hire the right experts to help them with their claims. And they're just going all in on some of these claims that obviously are very, very strong, which is why this whole thing is very messy, unfortunately. And, and you know what? I, I'm pretty sure everyone that was looking at this, uh, at this whole lawsuit was hoping we get better clarity out of it. But lo and behold, we did it. I don't think FTC got any better clarity. They're, obviously, if you were to Google FTC's position on this, they are spinning this as a huge win for them. You know, uh, I don't know, industry, on the other hand, they're spinning it as a uh, not a big win for FTC and actually an interesting case for Quincy, but not necessarily a win. You know, it's, it's interesting for sure, which is, again, it's gray. It's not as simple as black and white, and which is why when I'm working with clients, I like to dig into things a little bit more. Um, and in particular, I do use the randomized control trial as my baseline. Uh, you know, when I'm working with clients, the larger ones, you know, they're looking for uh, people to you know, invest in them. They're looking for investors. They're looking for cash injections. Those investors, you know, if they know what they're doing, they have their lawyers, they have their compliance people look at these things. So they are using FTC standard as the bar. And so we use that as well. So when we're doing formulation development for our clients, we are you know, looking at this as part of our whole process. And one of the resources that we use, uh, although it's a starting point, it is not the actual resource, is um, a, a website called examine.com. Uh, I'll have uh, an affiliate link down in the description down below. And there, you know, if you type in the ingredient, they'll show you the studies, etc. Like I said, it's a starting point. When I, when I, 
do the research on for our clients. We're going into the actual studies. We'll do like we'll go into Google Scholar. We'll go to PubMed. We might go into the universities and actually pull the full text clinical trials and look at those to really understand the studies, the vulnerabilities, the safety and efficacy of the ingredient um, and on the subjects. All of these are, things are really important, but it's also a fairly time intensive exercise. But I, we believe it's very important for the right customer or the right client. So anyway, I'm going to leave it there. Hopefully you found this educational. I'm going to do another video <clears throat> on claims itself because I know a lot of people do want to talk about clinically studied. They want to know, you know, may support, help support. Why can't I do disease claims? We're going to dive into that in a future video. All right, I'll leave it there. Until then, cheers.